All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, excited to be here. I have a cool panel with some friends that I've met along the way in my career working in blockchain technology, um, now working in decentralized finance. And today I wanted to talk about the future of finance, but more so uh, regenerative finance in this new era of altruism. So uh, what regenerative finance is, is it's not only this, this buzzworthy term that has, that was introduced relatively recently, but is this like cultural pre preference for funding of community and public goods over or in parallel to projects that are expected to produce a return for investors. And what's interesting is, is the role of blockchain and decentralized finance um, playing as a facilitator for, for regenerative finance. Uh, so essentially they're using money as a tool to do good. Uh, but what's arguably more interesting is Web3's role in all this, which is which is really this, this great awakening of the sovereign individual and peer-to-peer -peer distributed networks. Um, that are increasingly reshaping our reality. So now not only do we have systems allowing us to, to disintermediate away from beneficiaries, from banking, but have discovered um, and also implemented new methods in addressing and creating positive global impact uh, using blockchain. So I wanted to bring on some OGs from the space to discuss this future of finance. But first, I'll introduce myself. I'm the co-founder of Popcorn. Uh, Popcorn is a DeFi protocol that aligns financial well-being with positive global impact. So our, our yield generating products and asset strategies simultaneously fund nonprofits and social impact organizations that are also collectively determined by the Popcorn DAO at no additional cost to the user. So I'll let uh, Fabian from the lounge introduce himself and then uh, we can have Cameron introduce himself and then we can get at it. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Michael. Yeah. So, so my name is Fabian. Um, I have been in crypto for a couple of years now, and uh, I now mainly contribute to a bunch of investment DAOs. The most famous one is probably the Lao, out of which we have spun up a bunch of other DAOs, namely Flamingo DAO, Neon DAO, and a few others. DAOs essentially are a new form of capital formation. Uh, we operate like a fund, so we invest in early stage products. Um, but the difference is that we don't have LPs. We are a collective of people that pool capital and invest in projects. Popcorn is one of them. That's how Michael and I met. And yeah, within Allow, we're quite passionate about everything that's going on in region finance. So yeah, excited about the panel. Great. Yeah, and, uh, I guess I'm next. My name is Cameron Dennis. I work at the Near Foundation um, on the grants team. So super passionate about how you know programmable money can realign incentives, especially since I I think everyone here kind of would agree that one of the main one of the main reasons why the world is so messed up is because the incentives are messed up. And with programmable money, this is the first time we're able to completely rewire that. Um, so we can have things like regenerative um, finance and really just bring more transparency and accountability to our existing systems. Um, my background is actually in education. I run a blockchain education nonprofit in the United States uh, called the Blockchain Acceleration Foundation, and we start blockchain development courses at universities for units. So if you're studying computer science at UCLA, University of Texas, Austin, and others, um, you can actually get credit towards your degree for learning about blockchain development. And so, uh, yeah, great to be here, Michael, and uh, happy to tell you guys more about how Near is uh, carbon neutral. By the way, before we started this, I hopped into Brave and I saw uh, a, a Near advertising. You guys are going pretty full throttle there. <laughs> you have a lot of cool graphics on there, like all the time. It's cool. Um, actually, we met in ETC, right? We were in a park and you came over and I, in fact, had never heard of Near. And this was like what July of last year. Yeah, just about. So you guys, you started explaining to me what Near was and how it very much was this new blockchain, as well as like ecosystem that like really like abstracted like the complexities away from like blockchain, um, and used it very much or, or created this sort of like more user friendly or perhaps like more product fit, market fit um kind of retail approach. And I think like when you first explained it to me, I was like, what? And then. We met again, I believe, in Lisbon, which is actually where I met Fabian. Um, and you had pitched me more about it. So it's it's really exciting to see like what's happening with Nier right now. But anyways, um, first thing I want to talk about is uh, 
Hmm. So I think, I think we can all agree like much of the innovation happening in the application layer. So the application layer being on top of uh, the blockchain uh, is very much decentralized finance specific. And we're just scratching the surface when it comes to uh, like how ESG or regenerative finance in DeFi uh, fits in. So my first question is for, for Fabian. So like, what, what are your thoughts on, on this new frontier uh, in, in blockchain, uh, specifically with regenerative finance, where it's heading and like what, what excites you about it and perhaps like what are some of the obstacles that we face? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. Um, I think, first of all, if you, if you look at crypto right now, there's been a ton of innovation on, on the DeFi side, as you mentioned. And I think what is going to be the next frontier is break, crypto breaking out into real world use cases. And I think regenerative finance is one of those big use cases, because if you think about it, crypto is really in the essence a form of coordination of capital and, and work. And it's doing that incredibly efficiently. That's why very, very small teams can have an incredibly big impact, um, both in the world, but also in terms of how they allocate capital. And if you don't think of it from the other side, where is that needed the most? Then definitely ESG is, is probably the biggest problem that humanity has to solve. So I think that's why there is a lot of potential for there being, being a very, very big fit. And I think the problem to crack that is very, very difficult because you always have the challenge of bringing the real world side the ESG side into the crypto side and actually using the crypto mechanics, I think that's very complicated. Um, but there are, I think, especially cracking this particular bridge to the real world and, and the blockchain world is what now a few very, very intelligent and smart teams are working on right now. Um, one of the most famous ones is Toucan, um, which is um, a method to bridge carbon credits on chain. And they're actually using those carbon credits to, in essence, burn them or block them up in a treasury and then create a currency that is backed exclusively by carbon credits, which on the one hand has the benefit that you have money that is green. Using that money is, is, is absolutely ESG positive. And simultaneously, you take carbon credits out of the circulation, right? They are locked and they are locked forever, um, which is a very, very interesting thought concept because um, if that really, if this project goes really, really big, then that could take a lot of carbon credits out of circulation and would make it more complicated for companies to just buy carbon credits and therefore offsetting um, their, their emission uh, regulations that they have to fulfill. So I think that's why the space is incredibly interesting. Uh, I'm very, very excited about it. As the Lao, we're very excited about it. And yeah, I think especially maybe that's that's a segue to, to Cameron. Um, I think the, the, the branding of, of Near is incredibly positive in that sense because I know that the mechanism of near the consensus mechanism is essentially ESG neutral completely. I think that's also very, very important to communicate that to the outside because I think there has been a lot of stories around actually blockchains not being very environmental friendly. A lot of that in crypto, we call that FUT, um, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, I think we can all agree that some of that is true for sure, but in the grand picture, actually, it, it won't be true. Um, and yeah, maybe Cameron, you can, you can explain a little bit. Um, what is near is doing um, that is ESG positive compared to other blockchains. Yeah, absolutely. So um, near is actually certified carbon neutral by the um, South Pole, which is an international nonprofit. I think they have over a couple hundred employees that verifies um, the outplantation of trees and, and carbon sequestration of, of large organizations. And so what near does is actually a portion of our uh, transaction fees go towards planting trees to offset any carbon emissions that um, are generated through the validation process. And when I say by validation process, it's, you know, all a blockchain is, is one giant database. It's just something that gets updated as transactions, i.e. payments happen. And so when a payment happens, it needs to get verified by a series of validators and that these validators are running on, you know, on-premise somewhere and use electricity. So we're able to calculate how much electricity is used and then plant trees according to the amount of carbon that is, is being emitted. But um, besides that, <clears throat> this is, at, well, on top of that, there is, uh, this increases a huge demand of a lot of kind of tier one companies like Shopify for getting involved in the blockchain space because they're so committed to carbon neutrality that they're actually, uh, they support near for minting NFTs in Shopify premium marketplaces. So to me, this is just the, the beginning of, you know, a, the mass adoption in this space. 
And um, as many of you may have seen or like tried, blockchains are actually cryptocurrency wallets are sort of difficult to, to manage. And, you know, people lose their keys. You hear of these horror stories. But what's great about Near is that um, all the wallets are human readable, which means I'm Cameron.Near. That's my username. So if I were trying to, you know, send money to Michael or vice versa, all he would have to do is send Cameron.Near money instead of a long 0x, blah, 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 blah. And it's not just money. It's all digital assets. So this includes your, you know, any sort of pictures, any sort of uh, data that you might generate through a, a Web3 application like Popcorn um, can actually be owned by the user for the first time. And this is why it's so powerful. Like we're talking about money and, and information, like the two things that essentially run the world. And um, now it's actually possible for you to own it verifiably yourself in an easy way. So um, I've actually worked with like most of the blockchain companies out there through my nonprofit, building curriculum at these universities. And um, NEAR is by far the, the thing that's easiest for mass adoption. And as a testament to that, um, I actually organize a lot of education in, in lower income areas um, that people aren't at all familiar with, you know, financial literacy or anything. And I'm actually getting them to create wallets and mint NFTs in a matter of five minutes. And so, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter um, if you're at all interested in like receiving a wallet, testing this out yourself. I'm a Cameron underscore Dennis underscore. Yeah, I think one of the the things that was most intriguing about when you explained near to me for the first time was the the carbon offsetting aspect of it because that's something that we had integrated into popcorn where a percentage of the the uh the transaction fees on on the protocol uh go to carbon sequestration and reforestation projects but actually um now i i mean just if if you if you take a look at the statistics of where we're heading in terms of like climate change uh you know i think when we first integrated this this api that allowed us to to send those uh transaction fees or percentage of those transaction fees it was very much like okay we can be carbon neutral and now it's becoming more important to be the carbon negative um and so like we incorporated these uh, basically smart contract parameters that allow you to uh, configure them in, in order to or configure them to to increase the transaction fees in order to create even more impact um but yeah i mean a, a little bit more about near um that that interests me as well is more of like the like the account and like guild model that you guys have set up because i think like comparatively to other blockchains and this really comes down to like education it's really about it, it's just like a constant uh or it, we have to be like very much consistent in terms of like educating not only people in crypto because like i work in DeFi, and every day is a new day for me in terms of like what's happening in, in the tech in the space but so what does that mean for people like outside it's like like the like the crypto, I don't want to call them, well, crypto noobs. So people, or people that just want to get into the space. It's, it's always like a, it's always a task for, it's, it, I would say it's a requirement if you work in crypto or in DeFi um, that you do educate the people that are not only users within crypto, but are outside as well. So that's why Near is like very cool as well, because you guys are like very like well organized in terms of how you're, you're addressing like an onboarding new users and also going back to like what you, what you've done with, uh, um, carb being carbon neutral, or carbon negative. Like I thought that was pretty cool too. So, um, I guess that sort of like feeds into this next topic I want to talk about. What is it about? So near obviously big ecosystem, very much part of web three, the Lao is perfect example of a DAO. Um, formed through Web3. So what is it about Web3, this like neb nebulous X factor that has helped us arrive at not only decentralized finance, but now helping shape up our regenerative finance. And so Fabian, perhaps you can discuss your experience contributing to a DAO um, and if regenerative finance is something the Lao is actually paying attention to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the end, as, as I mentioned initially, Web3 makes it just so much easier to quickly form a group of people around a specific topic and raise capital and then allocate that capital um, based on a majority vote or based on a governance mechanism. And I think probably some of you have seen in news recently, Constitution DAO, which maybe was not a very successful example, but it was a great example on the on the outreach, something like that can have uh, on, on the public 
um, that a group of people can form very, very quickly with one specific goal um, and then allocate capital, raise actually significant amounts and then allocate that capital. What we have seen in, in the Lao is that for us, I mean, for us, it was very, very important to still have that legal side um, actually baked into our model. That's why we're called the Lao, um, not the Dao. Um, the Lao means that we are illegally wrapped out. So everything that we do on chain, our capital formation is mirrored by a company structure, uh, which is incorporated in the US. We have a Delaware LLC. And the benefit of that is that this essentially mirrors what we do on chain one to one. So, um, and the regulations are very forthcoming in that sense. So, for us as individuals, when we do investments, the, the the Delaware LLC functions as a pass-through entity, so we don't have any specific tax implications. Um, we're just taxed as if we would do investments on an individual level, um, not to get into any tax talk. Um, and in addition to that, also there's no CEO, no central management, which if you do traditional investments in traditional finance, usually you have a J GPLP model, a general partner and a limited partner. And the general partner is the entity or the person that is eligible to make investment decisions of the limited partner's money. And that always, of course, implies a lot of regulatory aspects, a lot of regulatory risks, because I can't just go out as, an, as a GP and buy a bunch of yachts with the LP's money. And so that's why there are a lot of regulations that want to prevent that, which is very, very sensible. But it, of course, makes the whole formation process very, very slow. Um, and in the model of a DAO, there is not uh, no distinction between the GP and the LP. In essence, we are all, every member of the Lao is a GP and the LP at the same time. Um, maybe to give it a little bit of light in the scope, we are now um, 70 members. Um, we have init initially contributed um, roughly $10 million in, in capital. Um, we pooled that and uh, yeah, we made uh, a bunch of investments. We now have a little bit over 100 portfolio companies and we continue to invest in portfolio companies that we think are interesting. So um, ESG is one of the categories that we're very excited about. But what we do additionally now, which I think is very interesting, is that we form DAOs which are specifically focused on one specific purpose and one specific area. So an ESG DAO is something that we are very excited about because of course naturally those initially 70 members of the Lao, they have a lot of expertise in crypto, but I think you can enrich that a lot with some people who have great expertise in ESG. So um, I don't want to give up too much of our, of our future roadmap, but the likelihood is high that we will spin up a DAO that is focused on, on, on ESG. And then we would get a new members who have expertise in that field. And then that DAO would exclusively focus on funding projects in exactly that area. Or to go even further, what we're doing with Flamingo DAO, which is an NFT DAO, now the biggest NFT DAO, and the collection is worth over a over billion dollars, is that, of course, we're still collecting NFTs, we're collecting art, but actually we go further and we um, actually fund artists and we uh, incorporate artists um, and, and help them to get visibility, help them to do mints. And I think that's really, really exciting when you go beyond just allocating capital, but actually incubating projects. And I think this is something that in the ESG aspect of crypto will be a very exciting new frontier and um, yeah, that's that's what we're going to focus on. Um, maybe two sentences about popcorn. Why um, I, I personally, when I met Michael, I, I was instantly very excited about about the product because um, in crypto, I think a lot of people are very very much focused on the monetary upside in crypto. That's that's naturally given, right? If you look at prices, there's a lot of volatility, but in the end. I think crypto can be used for, for much, much more. And I think popcorn is one of those applications and not the application that makes it incredibly easy to branch out of just the ever spinning casino of buying a coin and selling a coin, but actually using your capital to do something good without needing to directly invest it into a specific ESG fund. Um, I think a lot of people maybe don't have the expertise to know what will yield great returns and maybe also don't really wanna have that mindset and I think what popcorn offers where you invest in something that is somewhat similar to a savings account um, where your assets generate a yield and just part of the yield that in other products just go um, into the treasury of the project are here now used to invest in, in ESG positive projects um, where I think also the popcorn team actually has built some very exciting integrations. I think that's very, very exciting because then 
um, as it all, all of a sudden taps into that market of the entire crypto stablecoin industry, if you want to call it that, which I think is now, I don't have the numbers on top of my head, but I think we're probably at $200 billion worth of stable coins now. Last time I checked, it was 100, but that's already like four months ago. So we're growing a lot. Um, so that's a huge market. And I think that's very exciting. Yeah. So regarding stable coins, I think the other day I saw a statistic about Uniswap surpassing stable coin volume on Coinbase and Binance. It could have been only Coinbase, but I thought that was just super. I mean, that's if that's not an indicator of where all this is going, then I don't know what it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to go into, into Uniswap so much, but it is this, it, I would say it is one of the significant pivot points in crypto that's essentially validated like why like crypto and, and why uh, the future of money, the future of finance within decentralized finance um, is here. Something else I wanted to, I wanted to touch on, I mean, given that I would say, or I, I would assume that a lot of the audience perhaps doesn't, perhaps doesn't know what a DAO is. And really what that is, is just an internet community. It's a, it's a community of people that have organized online um, and they have the benefit of using blockchain technology in order to, to coordinate. Um, I don't want to go too much into the DAO, but uh, I mean, popcorn, the popcorn DAO is very crucial in terms of like how we uh, determine which beneficiaries receive the earned protocol fees, uh, as well as um, the grant elections as well. So we do everything through a DAO vote now. And that actually was interesting in terms of the transition, transition of being in a small team, having unilateral decisions, and then launching a token, and then all of a sudden recalibrating and having the community essentially help decide on what, what exactly we're doing, not only in terms of like the, the yield generating products that we're working on um, and the different products or ecosystems that we want to involve, but also like how we're, we're creating impact. And uh, I, want to, I want to let uh, Dennis uh, go for this for now. So like, I'm, I'm curious how, um, you know, near is, is, well, obviously prepared for like Web3, but uh, given your customer support model, um, uh, yeah, if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, my my main thing is like, no one should really even know that they're using blockchains. Like the goal is to have this run like it, like HTTPS runs. It's on every single secure URL, but no one really cares. Um, we should really be promoting the projects built on top of Nier. Um, and Nier is just an infrastructure. So the people who should care about Nier really are developers and, and traders. But as this mature, as this ecosystem matures, it should really be focused about the products built on top. And so, one of the key ones that is building on your right now is called the Open For Open Forest Protocol, and this is an open digital platform to incentivize the outplantation of trees, to measure their uh, growth and their carbon sequestration, and even manage the uh, the allocation of human resources to monitor the the growth. And so, um, you can go to openforestprotocol.org. Um, they have a very large growing community. Um, they're working with a couple of really amazing projects from all around the world, because what's interesting here is that, um, you know, with programmable money, you can actually make impacts anywhere. This is a very international industry. This is not U.S. centric um, and where this is now the time where you can actually just focus on, uh, you know, actually sequestering more carbon rather than where because one hundred dollars in India goes a lot further than one hundred dollars in the United States. And so. OFP is, is focused on this. Highly recommend checking them out. Um, and this one's uh, not on Near, but there are other amazing projects in the Near and in just the general blockchain ecosystem for those interested. Um, Region Network is another, um, but I don't think Cosmos is uh, carbon carbon neutral. So if you're focused on carbon neutrality, uh, definitely check out Near. But the uh, one point I did want to get across is, yeah, the cryptocurrencies really do provide this new mechanism of of coordinating just money and power. Um, every, as I mentioned earlier, since everything on the blockchain is timestamped and recorded on the chain, you have a, a key that matches with the transactions to verify that that is your activity. Why this is so important is because now you can verify not only ownership of your own assets, but ownership of your participation in the protocol. And what's another really cool thing is you could even delegate your vote for someone else. For example, if I'm not an expert 
in you know carbon sequestration, but somebody else in your ecosystem is, and there's a vote that happens around, hey, what is the amount of you know we should reward for X? I'm going to delegate my vote to them. And if you start seeing how this can completely shift governance processes today, um, it's really fun- foundational to I think the the future of coordination. Um, and so what NIR is doing, we have an amazing grants program. Uh, we all, we announced this in November, and I think that was when the token price was around like $8. And uh, we announced it in $850 million grants program. Um, that grants program today is probably upwards of a billion. And so this is where if you're building a application, and we actually really like projects focused on, you know, environmental, uh, just con- the environmental projects, um, you can receive capital for this in NIR tokens. Um, so I help run this program. Uh, there's even a sort of sub program within it called Fast Grants, um, but you can go to near.org slash grants if you're interested in learning more and getting funding for your uh, for your projects. Um, so Fabian's definitely focused on like the, you know, the investment side of things. And then there's these huge foundations that have a large treasury to allocate to projects who are focused on mass adoption. So um, and what's also interesting about near just the general community is that there are these things called guilds. And Michael highlighted this a little earlier um, where there's dedicated groups of people to support certain verticals. So if you need web developers, if you need smart contracting engineers, if you need token economic designers, there are certain guilds for your needs. And so, you know, this is where we're really building honestly an entire new economy. And it's a little overwhelming at times, but it's, it's overall, uh, a really good thing. So don't hesitate to reach out to me on Twitter. So I would assume that both of you worked uh, in, well, obviously in the traditional space. I mean, I come from traditional finance. So I used to work in credit suites and private banking, but I've been in an ecosystem for five years, which uh, probably equates to like 35 years, given how fast everything moves in, in DeFi. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just curious, like how you guys, do you, do you ever think about exactly like what the difference was in terms of working for a corporation uh, comparatively to like how you interact with like your peers and colleagues in the Lao or near right now, because it it really is this, it it, it is this idea, I I would say of like shared value creation that is very, it's hard to quantify, but also like very much uh, is the, I would say like the main driver, not only in popcorn, but I think in probably in every other organization in crypto and web three, um, that is like what, uh, I think makes us all enthusiastic about like what we're working on. So I'm just curious, like what you guys, uh, think about that. Awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I I don't come from a from a traditional finance background. My background is in startups. Um, I founded co-founded one startup in Malaysia, one in Singapore, and one in Berlin. Um, and with startups, you would assume well, that those are very much like uh, fast paced, fast paced environment. You know, move fast, break f- things. Uh, this is the mantra of, of what's the mantra of Facebook. But what I really learned what that means was when transitioning transitioning into into Web three because everything was so much faster, the the pace of innovation, but simultaneously also so much more accessible. While in Web 2, it still matters what kind of school you went to, what kind of background you have. In Web 3, you can just be an anonymous person on the internet with a frog as a profile picture. And you just go into a Discord server and you start chatting with the team and you can just start chatting up the CEO and say like, hey, I have an idea for your protocol. What do you think about this and this? And you need to just start working with them. And a week later, you have a job and no one ever asks you for any credentials. And I think this is so incredible because this really completely breaks, not just with how companies work, but with how we get work and how we actually work actually completely breaks with the traditional um, traditional system where you have to, to get a job, you have to file applications, you have to go through these tedious interview processes, you have to do cases, right? The only thing that matters in Web3 is what kind of value to, you bring to the table. Maybe a little bit of a personal story for myself, like how I started with, with the Lao. Um, the Lao was really founded by, by, by crypto OGs who are way, way, way more OG than, than myself. I started in crypto in early 2017. Um, and the people, uh, Aaron Wright, the founder of the Lao, um, was, was one of the persons that helped to advise uh, the Ethereum crowd sale. Um, so really, really OG. But their premise was that we're just going to open up the Lao and we're going to open up for everyone. Um, we're going to have like a basic introduction call to see if the people are real and if be, they would be engaged. 
Um, and this was basically the intro call for, for myself and for a lot of others. Um, and this was an incredible opportunity that I think to get to that level and to interact with these, these individuals, it would have not been possible for me if not for the openness of Web3. And I think that's so incredible. And also to the point that Michael mentioned before, now you're operating as a DAO. Um, it's incredible because now all of a sudden you have token holders who actually have a say in which direction the company um, goes. And I think this is, brings so much closer to customer feedback and the user feedback and your investor feedback, who are often just the same stakeholders, um, brings it much closer together than what you have in, in Web2. And I think that's an incredibly exciting uh, way of working. And I, I personally think I could never go back into going to the, to the corporate structure. I tried. I tried <laughs> When I was in Miami last year, I tried to leave crypto and get a normal job. And I did. But then in the last moments, I, uh, I decided to, I, I couldn't leave. <laughs> so, here, here we are now. I'm now full throttle in crypto once again. But uh, yeah, maybe uh, Cameron, like you can talk about like how the near token um, is used in, in, uh, the, in near protocol. Yeah. So um for the near token, it's it's really just a it's a utility token and a governance token. So what that means is you can actually you you need the near token in order to transact on the near network. Um, now gas fees can actually be paid in other tokens, which is a really cool feature that most other protocols don't offer. Um, but right now it's uh, primarily just a token used for 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 governance and for paying gas. Um, now, I do actually want to highlight a little bit about like getting into the space for newcomers because, you know, I, I run this nonprofit. We placed around 30 people at jobs in the last year, um, sort of this like on ramp for, for people interested in working Web3. But there are some some caveats. It's amazing. Like, you know, you can pick your hours. You can work anywhere in the world. It's all you know, totally remote. It's like uh, there's not very much nepotism. So it's more about like actually producing things instead of like what school you went to or who your dad is or whatever the hell. And um, since it's completely international, anyone can get involved. Now, the caveats is that the, the markets never close. <laughs> and so what that entails is that it's an industry that never sleeps. And it's really sort of hard to keep updated on everything that's going on. So if you are entering the space for the first time, uh, you know, create a Twitter if you don't have it already and start following, you know, legitimate accounts that are ideally aren't going to scam you. Don't get your crypto news from TikTok or Instagram. That's a really important note because um, there's a lot of bad actors in the space as well, um, which is just really important to highlight. So make sure to always do your own research before you know getting involved in a project. Um, and again, like feel free to reach out to me if you're like, hey, is this is this thing a scam? Because um, there are lots of scams, and it is critical for you not to get looped into that. Don't click random links is another thing, but um. On the near side of things, yeah, there's. Uh, I'm really passionate and interested to see the growth of um, a DAO framework um, on here called Astro, um, E A S T R O, um, and the whole point of this is so people can create a DAO within honestly like a minute or two, set up governance structures, has bounty payouts, has all the features that um, you know essentially every other organization can have. We're also thinking like, you know, creating uh, features within the DAO to create legal wrappers uh, for them, as well as banking services and everything else. And so um, if you're interested in sort of launching your first DAO, uh, just check out astrodao.com. Um, there's over, I think, like 400 DAOs on near today and over $26 billion locked into the, all the different ones. Um, one of the projects, because near is uh, Ethereum compatible. Uh, through an application called Aurora. Um, Aurora's entire treasury lives within an Astro DAO. Um, and so this just sort of shows how robust these systems actually are. Um, and we've been focused on like building good technology since the very beginning. Everything is, you know, audited and, and controlled. Uh, when I say controlled, it's like making sure that uh, it's secure because what we've seen recently is actually not just once, but hacks happen. And so don't be going to spend a bunch of money in this industry if you can't lose it. Um, there's a lot of, it's still very nascent and this, as well with regulations. Um, that's just a, some, some tips for, for those interested in getting involved because it can be overwhelming at first. Um, yeah, but Michael, is there anything else you wanted to know specifically about Nier? Uh, no, I mean, what was the, 
I think it was like roughly like 350 million in like your, your DeFi incentive program that you guys launched towards the end of last year too. That's that's something that was pretty. Uh, um, yeah, not small numbers. Um, <laughs> these are, uh, the whole point here is how do we make sure that there's enough liquidity um, for these systems to operate properly? I mean, going back to my point, like we are building an entire new economy. This means that there needs to be the money there to you know move between assets. And so uh, we did launch this $350 million liquidity program. Um, it's going very well. A lot of that is being deployed for uh, Aurora, which is, again, the Ethereum compatibility component of NIR. Um, and you can see things starting to really pick up right now. If you go to defilama.com slash Aurora, you can check that out. Um, but yeah, there's there's tons of capital. Now, the key thing is how, how do we build new uh, grant allocation models? Because these foundations are essentially as large as some small governments, and um, all government, most governments, at least the robust ones, have uh, grant programs for funding science and funding, you know, public goods at scale. And so there's this fantastic conference by Protocol Labs. If you're really passionate, like interested in new funding mechanisms for public goods, um, which is an environment <laughs> like clean air and clean water is a very clear public good. Um, you should check out that conference. It's called Funding the Commons. And what's cool about crypto is that now that you're able to essentially build uh, governance systems that you cannot act outside of. So there's this phrase in the crypto space like um, don't trust verify. And then like that's one of them. And then the other one is um, can't do good, not won't uh, can't be evil, not won't be evil. So these smart contracts actually prevent you from acting outside of the, I guess, the commands within the contracts, if that makes any sense. And so why that's important is because you can't do evil when you're interacting with the contract unless you're hacking it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it's a really important thing for for governance systems where, you know, the quorum, like you won't be able to vote on something to pass unless the quorum has been met, unless X people have signed the transaction saying that they're present and they are who they say they are. Um, so it sounds kind of boring and basic, but I cannot emphasize the importance of this for, you know, honestly experimenting with new mechanisms of funding public goods at scale. Because time and time again, I think governments have failed us in, in some regards. So we need to sort of, I think, take this power back to the people and create some, you know, infrastructure to to, to facilitate it. And uh, yeah, I think it's just the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really the idea, and also obviously the mechanics of like the smart contract that really changed the game. Why there's more layer ones, uh, layer twos that are coming on board. I mean, completely different world from when I started in 2016. Uh, but to go back to decentralized finance and speak more about like regenerative finance, how long do you think DeFi, and this goes back to the liquidity aspect of uh, what you were talking about with Nier, um, because from my perspective, it seems like there's this just consistent rollout of, of liquidity that acts as a tool for other DeFi protocols. So liquidity, it's very much the, um, or DeFi is very much the function of liquidity. And so, you know, that's how like popcorn kind of operates. But at the same time, I think there's always this question that I get from like outsiders, you know, how, how, how do these lucrative returns really exist? How long can they last? Um, will this always be the case going forward? Um, so for, for Fabian, how does how does the Lao evaluate projects um, in what seems like this like never ending avalanche of projects that are coming into each L1 and L2 ecosystems? Do you think do you think this is a good sign? Is it are, are we becoming overly saturated? Is the market becoming more legitimized? Like what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, maybe first of all, I mean, you had a question that you get a lot when you tell someone that you can get. Like twenty percent annual yield on your on your stable coins, which is effectively, if if it can't get hacked, it would be like a savings account, right? And twenty percent of that on that would just be um, an incredibly high high yield. How is that possible? I think that definitely yields, of course, as liquidity increases increases will go down. However, I think they will always be higher in traditional finance, um, which I think is maybe a little bit of a controversial take, but. 
the reason for that is that on the one hand, in, in crypto, the yields are defined by supply and demand by the market. So um, if you're doing lending borrowing, then your, your lending rate is always defined by how much appetite is there for borrowing. And borrowing usually comes from the appetite for leverage. And there's just inherently in crypto, there's a high appetite for leverage. And since the interest rate that you're getting paid is function of a system, of a supply and demand system, rather than a central entity that says the yields are like this and this is what you can give out, um, I think they will naturally always, always be higher um, because you just have the borrowing side just to be much, much, much more, more flexible. Um, and then the second aspect of that is, is capital efficiency. And this is a concept that's, I think, quite, quite difficult to understand if you're not knee deep into crypto, is that you are able to simultaneously make a deposit into a lending protocol and then use that same deposit in an automated market maker and in an exchange and then generate trading fees on that. And maybe on top of that, um, the protocols, entering protocols incentivize you by giving out their token, their share for you as a reward for depositing into, into their protocols. So basically with one deposit, you're generating yield from, from three sources. Uh, and that's, I think, in traditional finance, very, very unusual, um, very difficult to, to, to wrap your head around like these, this wrapping of yields on top of each other. Um, of course, in traditional finance, you have, you have under collateralized loans, which is something that in, in crypto we don't really have. Um, but I think on the, on the yield generation side, I think that's why in, in, in DeFi, the yields will always be higher and always, will always fluctuate as well. Um, and then how as allow um, on the question on how we evaluate projects, really we're trying to primarily bet on teams. Um, I know this is a very boring and, and VC style answer, but we've just seen time and time again that especially since the velocity crypto is so incredibly high, it's difficult to really look ahead into the future for more than six months to see where it's going. I think in in 2019 and 2020, no one would have guessed that NFTs will be the most dominant theme in crypto. And in the end, what that means is it's difficult to kind of make one specific bet on one specific theme and say this will dominate crypto forever. I think that's quite difficult to say. There are some underlying mechanisms which will probably always stay, but what applications on top will be the ones that win, I think will be that will vary a lot. If we take popcorn as an example, um, the initial product I think is incredibly amazing, but I think going into the future, there are so much more products um, that can be rolled out under that umbrella, under the idea of using deposits for doing something good. And we think popcorn is the team that, that can pull that off. Um, that's why we, we, we bet on popcorn. Um, and then of course, on the influx of, of layer ones, um, I think it's very positive for the space uh, because it, it, forces kind of the, the incumbent Ethereum and the adjacent layer twos to innovate and to be pushed to scale. Um, and all the narratives that are being put on top, let's say Rust uh, on Solana, I'm not gonna get too technical here, but Solana has some aspects that make it easier to develop some applications. And then these innovations that are being found there are gonna be transported back to Ethereum and to other layer ones. Or if you take Near that has the ESG aspect, if there's a blockchain that is that is carbon neutral and they do business development with um, with traditional finance uh, uh, investors, that's a huge advantage naturally. So this will force other blockchain environments to also adopt that that um, that aspect, and that just pushes the overall space forward. Um, so I think it's very net positive for the space. But of course, um, I think probably my, my panelists Mike and Cameron can agree that this can also be incredibly overwhelming that you have new layer twos. Uh, layer, layer ones and layer two spinning up at an incredible pace with new incentive systems and and it can get definitely challenged to pick the right ones to build on to pick the right ones to invest on so um yeah but that's also what makes the fun exciting the space exciting yeah thanks for that i mean near is very much entering entering the the DeFi arena i saw like the release i'm not sure if like bastion is out um i messaged you uh, about that cameron but um yeah, maybe you, maybe Cameron, like you can, I, I know we only have like three minutes left, but maybe you can like briefly touch on like what's happening with DeFi in near right now, some of the exciting projects um, that you think are coming out and perhaps uh, if there's anything happening in regenerative finance on near. Yeah, so I'll start with regenerative. Um, definitely check out Open Forest Protocol for those who, who haven't seen that already. Um, they're tokenizing carbon credits, creating an entire market for carbon credits. 
Um, and another really cool one is uh, Sisu. It's a NFT marketplace where a portion of all of the sales will go towards regenerative projects. Um, and those are the two of the two of the main ones. Um, there are a bunch of other ones that are slowly, you know, deciding if they want to build on here because it's like a it's a big decision when you choose a layer one to, to build on because this is the infrastructure of your enterprise or your business. It's not just the email provider. It's literally everything that your business runs on. So it's a big decision. And so, um, you know, I'm happy to say that there's over like 400 projects being built on on near today, um, about 200 live on, on mainnet. And in the DeFi ecosystem, uh, there's sort of two ecosystems that we're building at the same time. When I say we, it's not the foundation, it's not near Inc or Pagoda, it's like the entire ecosystem. Like every one of these businesses is a part of we. And this is the cool part of the crypto community is um, we're all sort of in it together. And so um, on your native, there are, it's Ref Finance, REF. Um, that's a decentralized exchange. There's a lending market called Burrow, which is just in beta. Um, and then there's an on-chain order book uh, called Spin. There's an off-chain order book called Orderly. A um, bunch of other pool, pool together is like a no-loss lottery system. Um, and kind of a, a good use case of crypto is like, since now you have like programmable money, you can create these incredibly... Uh, kind of sophisticated mechanisms to, to start extracting little portions of capital towards a certain cause. And I think the future of validators specifically will be, uh, people will be delegating their tokens to validators that match their um, philosophy. As liquid staking makes everything much more uh, competitive, people will be, you know, choosing validators that, you know, are, are dedicating money towards carbon initiatives or education or civil, you know, civil justice or whatever it may be. Um, and so that's possible in your today. Uh, there's even a cool way called a, a stake farming where you're even able to be allocated uh, the rewards in, in many different tokens. So let's say popcorn decides to run a near validator, the people delegating their near to the popcorn validator can receive popcorn as well in return. Um, so this is like super innovative uh, mechanisms of, of creating the, the capital needed to address some of the largest issues that this world is facing. Um, and then there's the uh, Aurora side of things. And this is where we're seeing a lot of the like copy and paste uh, projects from Ethereum, like, you know, forking Uniswap, forking uh, Ohm, folk, you know, a lot of like forking Aave. There are some, you know, new DeFi protocols like Bastion, as, as you mentioned, um, and some others that are, are building natively. And what's cool about Aurora is that you actually don't pay for gas. Um, we There's a, a way for verified accounts to never have to pay gas again. And so this is a the beginning of something absolutely huge. Um, and making it ideally completely abstract the blockchain experience away from end users. I mean, I run something called the Blockchain Acceleration Foundation, and I hate the word blockchain. I hate the jargon. It's all just, it keeps people away. It makes people feel like they can't be a part of it. And um, we're slowly breaking that down. But it's, it's going to take a little bit more time. And uh, it starts with key management. I think logging in is the killer app that we're all, we're all looking for. And uh, happy to chat more about this maybe another time if we are looking at more granular. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that. I think one thing we didn't really talk too much about, but like you can go over it super down like a or super deep into a rabbit hole is like really like how like token economics are structured and how all this sort of like becomes like interoperable with other uh, apps, other ecosystems. Um, but I know we're we're basically run out of time. So I just want to say thank you guys for uh, joining this panel with me. Awesome conversation. Um, to be honest with you, I didn't really prepare for it too much. So I think this went pretty well. Uh, I'm just going to do a little plug in. PopcornDAO.finance is live now. You can go in there. Liquidity mining starts tomorrow. And then we'll have <laughs> and then we'll have uh, more of our products and more blockchains that we'll be, re we'll be releasing uh, the, the app, which is Sweet Caramel, in the future. And yeah, that's it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Cameron. Thank all right. you all. Bye See bye you bye. Take care. Thank you, Michael, Cameron, and Fabian. Using the blockchain as a tool for good is a topic I am still very curious to learn more about. So thank you guys for your optimism and injecting hope into the future of our economy. All right. I'm not going to believe it but we've come to the end of our second festival of urgent reinventions. 
First, I just want to thank all of our speakers, the healers, the artists, sponsors, and of course, you all for showing up and creating space for these topics to be explored. I am deeply inspired and I hope you all feel the same. We are hosting another facilitated work session with Cave Day via Zoom. So please check your email inbox or Slack for that link. Uh, just another quick reminder, you'll have until Saturday at 11.59 Pacific Standard Time to submit your ideas. In addition, while you all are brainstorming and finalizing your briefs, we highly encourage you to stay plugged into our Slack channel to ask questions and engage with the community. Uh, our site, the4.live, will have all of the recorded sessions available. So if you need to watch or refresh, uh, just go to our page. Once you all submit your idea, uh, your entry will be reviewed by our event facilitators and experts in the, film, in the field of ideation. And lastly, I want to say it's really been incredible to just be in this space with you all. Uh, I'm truly honored that we could spend this time together. Uh, we truly do have the power to change more than we think, even if we're taking small steps forward. And with that, I'll leave you all with one of my favorite quotes from the late cultural anthropologist, Margaret Mead, and she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you all for showing up and coming along for this insightful two-day journey. I am eager to see what you all come up with. Again, my name is Carrie Human. I do need to step up my TikTok game, but feel free to connect with me on any other social media platforms if you want to be friends, and uh, that's at Carrie Human. Again, be kind to yourself, take care, good luck. Until we meet again, thank you all for joining us for the second annual Festival of Urgent Reinventions. Take care. Uh -huh.